Right. So, yeah, tense. Um, a little bit about the context of My Last Duchess. So that's quite interesting. We can talk about the poet. We can talk about a little bit of Renaissance Italy um, and about a real duke, a real duchess. And a little bit about the form as well, which is quite important. So we're going to touch on a couple of bits away from context, if that's OK. You do need to have either this, which was the B side of the poem that you have printed out hopefully. It's on the thing that I attached yesterday with the poem on one side, that on the other. Um, but if you're not using this and if you are using blank paper instead, that's still fine. You can still do this just by writing context up here and then writing down the notes that I tell you to take as we go. So um, just very quickly um, where you will find this context on one note, if I can just point this out if we go up to the content library up there and to years 10 and 11 and then along to where we see um, poetry and obviously this will be under the poems and then we can look at all the poems and we're looking at my last duchess and context and if you click these they will take you to these contextual presentations if you like now um, a little bit, first of all, about the poet. Um, you know, just take some of these notes down under the heading of context that Robert Browning is um, one of the most famous Victorian poets um, of all of them, really. Um, born in 1812, died 1889. Um, and he was inspired by... Um, the Romantic poets, he invented and tried to recreate the rhymes in their style. Um, you know, he was publishing poems from a very young age. He learnt um, at home and pretty much he became a bit of a, a, a child prodigy as far as poetry was concerned. Um, he married the already famous poet, um, Elizabeth Barrett. So she became Elizabeth Barrett Browning um, and then moved to Italy with her. They lived in Pisa with the famous Leaning Tower there, and then they lived in Florence. He was obsessed with Italy and its art and its culture and its history. Um, and that kind of um, shows itself with many of his poems, not just My Last Duchess. Um, and he perfected, some say better than anybody, um, a form of poetry known as a dramatic monologue. Um, and this is where you're going to move away from context and more towards form. So if you have this sheet, you'll be writing this here. So this pretty much needs replicated here. Otherwise, you can just make um, another note for form and we will add structure to that later. Um, so what I'm going to do is just read this and help you understand. It. A dramatic monologue is a poem in which a single speaker who is not the poet utters the entire poem at a critical moment. The speaker has a listener within the poem, but we are too his listener. It's like we're eavesdropping and we learn about the speaker's character from what the speaker says. In fact, and this is the important thing really, that the speaker often reveals unintentionally and betrays things about his or her character um, through the things that he says to the other person in the poem. Browning, it is said, perfected this form. Um, so at the time of his death, he was one of the most popular poets in England. He wasn't um, celebrated. So um, after his death, in the same way that lots of poets are, he was celebrated during his lifetime and after, I should add. And that's kind of it with the poem. So hopefully you've got some notes about the poet there. Um, another story, and this is quite interesting, and it's, um, it touches on Browning's own inspiration for this poem. Um, so it begins in um, Renaissance Italy, it's sort of in the 1500s, is a real Italian duke. Um, he really did live and his name was the Duke of Ferrara um, and that is just a region in northern Italy um, and you know he is the man in the poem or rather he, the, the man in the poem is very much based on him. Um, his ancestry and his family name could it is said, be traced all the way back to the year 940, and this he considered 
to be a great honour, as many people would. Others might say it's a little bit pretentious and aristocratic and empty-headed, but never mind. He married the first of his three wives, Lucrezia de' Medici, in 1558. Beautiful lady there she is. Um, and it was a short marriage, and it was a short life, actually, for her. Um, less than three years later, she was dead. Um, and this happened at the time, they thought, in rather strange and mysterious circumstances. There's lots that you can read about whether she was murdered or not. Um, but the point, I guess, is that she was gone because of the commands that he gave. Um, and whether, I mean, Robert Browning himself said that perhaps she just went to an, um, a convent, a nunnery, or perhaps um, he did have orders to have her killed. Um, he suggested both in a famous quote. Anyway, to introduce you to a few other characters in the poem, um, and we did touch on these in the Lego video, um, one artist and one sculptor. These are supposed to be famous. He invents these. Um, this is a, a picture of a, a famous artist. This, I imagine, is something like what Fra Pandolf would have looked like. He was a monk, um, or the word Fra at least means a monk or a friar or a brother. So he would have been a religious figure who was good at painting and a very good one um, because of the likeness with which he captured um, the Duchess. And he also invents the sculptor um, Klaus from Innsbruck, um, who sculpted Neptune taming the seahorse. And thirdly, there's a couple of vocab um, issues that I've like covered before we get into the language of the poem. It's important to understand all the words, pretty much. And I don't want you to write down words that you already know. That's a waste of time. However, um, ones that you don't know, I think it's worth making a note of. So countenance pretty much means somebody's expression. If you have a grim countenance, you've got a grim look on your face, a grim expression. Um, earnest is a word meaning genuine or bona fide or well meant. Um, and so I earnestly try to teach you. Um, durst is an old fashioned word meaning to have the boldness to try. So if you durst is if you dare have the boldness to try. Um, a spot of joy is mentioned in the poem, and this is a metaphor for a blush, um, which is like a, a blush on her cheeks, a sort of spontaneous reaction to something beautiful or lovely. A mantle is um, a cloak or a shawl, um, which would have been fashionable in the time. She had a fine mantle of silk, for example. Courtesy, you should all know this, showing politeness. Um, he or she was full of courtesy, for example. Trifling um, means unimportant or trivial. He was trifling with some small details as an example sentence. Forsooth is an old poetic word meaning indeed. So it just, just every time you see the word forsooth, just imagine the word indeed. Um, and munificence means generousness, means somebody with a generous heart. Um, and a dowry is quite important. Um, when people got married, um, actually not just in Renaissance Italy, but you know, in other places in Europe and elsewhere, um, it's the amount of property or money brought by a bride, typically her father or her family, um, to her husband in marriage. So there would have been, um, I'm trying to think how much dowry came with my wife, not very much. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. So hopefully you should have taken some notes on context and that little bit on form for dramatic monologue. Um, tomorrow we're going to get into the language form and structure with some annotation of the poem. So thank you very much your attends and goodbye.